Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 427 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's episode, Laura is with us. She's the mom of a small child who was recently, in the last couple of years, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and the way they got to the diagnosis was really interesting. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Just a quick reminder to check out the T1D Exchange at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. If you're a U.S. resident, you can add your data to the registry and help everyone living with type 1 diabetes. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. You, too, can use Arden's Blood Glucose Meter by going to contournext.com forward slash juice box. Everyone has a blood glucose meter, but you all don't have a meter like this. It's so easy to hold, use, and has incredible accuracy. You owe it to yourself to check out contournext.com forward slash juice box. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm married and have two kids. I have a 15-year-old stepdaughter um, who's lived with us pretty much all of her life. Um, and then we have a five-year-old son named Joseph, and he is our type one. He was diagnosed when he was three back in October of 2018. So we're coming up on our second uh, diversary. And we are, um, we've been at home for the last several months, you know, with all of the things going on. So it's really given us a chance to hone in on settings and kind of just focus on the diabetes without worrying about the school and, and everything. Mm. So uh, we're getting there. We're really, really doing well. Excellent. Oh, better than getting there. All right. Well, let's find out about it. So there's a couple of threads to your story that I want to pull on. Um, yeah. And first of all is we met somewhere. Where was that? We did. So I actually, um, I live about two hours east of Dallas. And there was a JDRF, I believe, Type 1 Nation Summit in the Dallas area. And I had a couple of friends that are in our local Type 1 group that we realized we were all going. And so we kind of met up there. And whenever I uh, realized that you were going to be on the speaker list, I, I didn't care what else was going on. If there was another session that was just as good. I was like, no, there's no way I have to go to that one. But um, funny story with that is, is I actually, um, before COVID had, a, it's funny how they say elective surgery, because it really wasn't elective. But um, I had to have a surgery around the same time as the conference mm -hmm. and told my husband, I said, um, I don't care if we need to push it back a week. You know, this is elective. They said it's not a major emergency. I said, I really want to go to this conference. I said, so let me go to the conference and then I'll have that surgery afterwards. So yeah, I actually planned the surgery to coincide after the conference. <laughs> you know, I was a late add to that one. And um, because of that, I got what I would consider like a side room. And, uh -huh. and I, I said to the person, I was like, look, well, I'll do that. I'm like, that room's not going to hold all the people, though, that are going to mm -mm. show up. And she's like, no, no, everybody's already picked other. I was like, yeah, okay, we'll see. And um, <laughs> that room was packed. People it were was. filling out the doors and standing along the walls and bringing in chairs for the aisles. And that was fun. We went to the keynote, uh, you know, earlier with the lunch. And it was funny because I was talking to my friend. Um, and I said, wouldn't it have been so much better if he had been the keynote and we could have filled this whole ballroom up instead of having to go into that little room? I thought the same thing. Nobody listens to me, though, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, those things are probably never going to happen again. So I think you came to the second to last one of those I'll probably ever do. So I know, you know. I know. Uh, but I, I really did have um, 
a, a good time. It was weird for me because I usually show up at those things and speak a number of times during the day. And because I was just sort of doing a favor at the end, mm-hmm. you know, and showing up kind of at the last minute, I just, it wasn't, I didn't know what to do for like hours in the middle of the day. I was like, what do you do now? Right. Do you, do you just like, I was walking around talking to people and I just didn't, I was, I, I was a bit at a loss, but the group was great. And I got to see, um, they hand out uh, questionnaires to the the people in the room at the end to fill out like what you think of the speaker and that kind of stuff, and I got to see that and it was really cool. Like I I know um, how much people enjoyed it, so it was uh, sure. it wasn't just my interpretation of how much they enjoyed it because in my own mind you all loved it. Just so you know. Oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so as a person who had heard the podcast prior, but then was sitting in the live. How did I do in an hour of encapsulating the podcast and making it seem like something you'd want to check out? And did it seem reasonable or did it sound like? Oh, for sure. It's one of those kind of things. You had both ends of the spectrum. You know, you had the ones that had been listening and wanted to be there, I guess, more for confirmation for themselves to kind of keep up what they've been doing, Mm -hmm. maybe see if there was any new things. Um, And then you had the ones that had never heard you before. And I think it was it was awesome. You know, once I left and um, went to the next one, it was a panel session and it definitely wasn't full by any means. I think we ended up um, leaving about halfway through it. I was like, yeah, I've, I've heard all this, but um, it was one of those things. Like I said, um, the ones that I never heard you before were just asking such great questions that, you know, you've covered on the podcast for sure. But uh, it was, it was great because I think they got that um, sense of, uh, I'm not sure how to say, but like a familiarity, like, you know, you're there in person and they can ask you this and, you know, one question fed off of another. It was, um, it's hard to compact all that information in such a short amount of time, but yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the biggest things I remember people noticing was the slide where you had all of the, uh, podcast episodes that you suggested to start with. And I think, uh, I think I saw like half the room cell phones go up and take a picture of it. It was, it was cool because I, I know a lot of people probably started listening after they left or, you know, on the way home or whatever. I, I have to tell you when I, in that specific room, there was an endocrinologist in the first row. Oh, and wow. I had met him the night before. He was really delightful and was telling me how much he enjoyed the podcast and everything. But there was times where, you know, I mean, listen, you're there. I'm not a medical person at all. Right. So I'm relaying my experiences, which are, for the most part, not consistent completely with what people are told in doctor's offices, right? And right. so I'm, I'm talking about what we do and, and conversations I've had with other people. And like my eyes would just drift over to him once in a while. <laughs> like, is he judging me or how's this going? But he was smiling. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, he's in. We're good. Like, you know, let, let's keep <laughs> going. Not that it's not, you know, I mean, you start the thing by saying, look, I'm not a doctor. This isn't medical advice. You know, right. you're going to hear about my experience with my daughter. I don't even have diabetes, for God's <laughs> sakes. You know, like, yeah, I mean, maybe you shouldn't even be here. It's like how I feel when I'm saying it. Um, But to see people rattling along and like you said, getting kind of jacked up and asking questions and and then the notes you get in the weeks afterwards are always very amazing like just like i never thought of this and you should see what it's doing for me anyway it was it was really nice to meet and and to be there i i really hope that one day we're all allowed to gather in rooms again and i uh, I really do (laughs) i would do i would definitely do more of it i uh i enjoyed it the traveling part is is not good that part i don't like very much didn't Um, you have like some experience at the airport i'm trying to remember if it was that one or another one oh no no yeah Yeah. yeah. i left there so what people don't know none of this is is a glamorous thing like you hump yourself in you know the day before you're going to talk and so you're pretty exhausted when you're talking to begin with and you know you get a car it used to be somebody put you in a taxi like a gentleman but now they're like Mm -hmm. get yourself a car and find your way here and you're like oh jesus all right okay you you know i'm not exactly an uber person so like you know i get to the hotel and there's some problems checking in and i get that all worked out and they give you a nice dinner and but you've i got a headache from the you know from the travel like i'm sitting there like oh my god you know and um and then it was all i felt like i got like paid back a thousand times by meeting everybody. But then I got back to the airport, which is, by the way, you're done. And then they're like, all right, well, get yourself to the airport. I actually, a person who came uh, to see me talk and I I got them to drive me. 
Nice. <laughs> my wife's like, one day you're going to get murdered. And I was like, <laughs> I, I said, I think I'm better off with people who like the podcast than just a random Uber guy, right? There you go. Yeah, so we get to the, I get to the airport. And I am really gassed. Like it's it's a quick turnaround. Like I'm back in an airport 36 hours after I was in one, and uh, I'm sitting there just trying to think. Like I'm going to go in the restroom and change into something more comfortable to fly in. And I'm sitting and listening to music and trying to find my center a little bit. And this person comes up to me and just kind of waves in my face. And I take out my headphones. And they're like, "Hi, are you Scott?" And I was like. Is this where it happens? Like, am I going to get <laughs> shot right in an airport? Like, what did I say on that podcast? You know, and yeah. it ended up being a, a person who was, you know, just a fan of the show. And I said, "Oh, were you just at my talk?" And she goes, "No." I was like, "Wait, what?" I'm like, "You're not from Dallas. We're happenstancely in an airport together, and you recognize me from a podcast about type one diabetes." Wow! <laughs> I was like, "I've made it." <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, but that was really nice. It, it, it really was like, it's not something, you know, you don't, you don't float a podcast into the world and think one day a random person in an airport is going to know who you are. It's right. Very weird. So Dallas definitely, uh, it was a great experience. Um, and I liked the I liked the people and, and everything, but, uh, like I said, I don't know when we'll ever do something like that again. Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, will you share with me what your elective surgery was? So um, I actually have a family history of um, colon cancer. And so my grandfather actually passed away from it um, back when I was, uh, I believe, a junior in college. So 15 years ago. Um, so anyways, my dad ended up and my aunt ended up having to have um, colonoscopies, you know, pretty regularly just to, you know, alleviate any you know problems. But um, it was never really passed down that I needed to do that or my sister needed to do that, you know, um, at that point. And, um, you know, I'm 36. And so uh, colon problems really aren't, you know, common at my age. It's not that they don't happen. It's just they're not common, but um, ended up having so long story short, um, I had been having some um, digestive issues and things, but kind of passed it off and it seemed to have gotten better um, about a year prior. And coincidentally, it was kind of around the same time that Joseph was diagnosed. So things really didn't, for me, um, they weren't in the forefront because, you know, I was thinking about him and everything and it really didn't feel like mine was a, that big of an issue. Of, of course. course, as a parent, yeah. you, you know, you, you take better care of your kids than you do yourself sometimes. But um, it had gotten to the point where I went to see a gastroenterologist after seeing my primary care physician. She said, let's get this checked out. Let's rule out something, make sure it's not something minor and you can just, you know, take some meds and, and get better or whatever. So see the gastro and he says, let's do a colonoscopy and an endoscopy. You've had some, um, you know, you, I have asthma and then I had the, um, some of the gastro problems that were showing up. And he said, let's go ahead and just do this and rule out things. And hopefully maybe it's just something simple. So I went in for that around Thanksgiving of this past year. Um, they find a polyp that was too large to remove uh, while I was in the colonoscopy. Endoscopy ended up being fine. Um, I had a hernia, but they were able to remedy that. Um, so he says, let's go ahead and schedule you for a surgery. It's elective. So, um, being in public education, I, I don't have a lot of time off. Um, and because it was elective, the hospital wouldn't do it around the holidays, which would have been perfect because I would have already been off for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ended up having that in February after the podcast and, or not after, sorry, after the, uh, conference. Yeah. So anyways, um, get the results back a couple of days, stay in the hospital. Um, I had to, it was a colon resection. They ended up taking out, I think four centimeters of my uh, lower colon. And it was kind of one of those. I wish that I would have probably taken care of this sooner, but thankfully it was a uh, good timing. Doctor said they caught everything, um, but that it could have eventually turned into colon cancer had it been left 10, you know, 15 years. So wow. it's one of those kind of things that, um, like I said, it was just good timing. Thankfully, didn't let it, you know, procrastinate any longer and, and got it done soon enough. That's but 
That's a serious yeah. story. I, thank God. I thought you were going to say like I was getting like butt implants or something like that. And then I thought, <laughs> you know. No. You know. And then when you no. said it was something serious, I thought, well, can you imagine that this story ends with her put this off to come to see me talk and then she had something really bad happen to her? I'm like, yeah. No, I wouldn't have told you if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> if I gave you cancer, you would have kept that out of this. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, thankfully, like I said, 10 to 15 years, it had a, a good lifespan. It would have happened in, but um. What's the the follow-up like now for this? Like, when do you have to, how often do you have to check in on it? So, a good thing about it is, is once they got it, it was the only one there. So, there's not really a lot of follow-up other than just um, every now and then. um, I think he said every two years, I'll have to go back for a follow-up colonoscopy. Um, And then, obviously, as they don't see things, they'll uh, span that out maybe to five years. Laura, do you have hair covering your microphone or something weird like that? You just got... Possibly. You just got much softer is that any better i don't know you have to say something can you hear me no it's far away is the mic near your mouth it's right near it get out of here how did that happen all right now you were talking and you just got you got farther away on me that's all mm-hmm. all right okay so there's follow-up to do um but there's there's no like you don't i mean I'm, they're not telling you you need to live like this is going to be a problem do you have to change anything no, about not at all eating or so prior to whenever I had gone to see the gastroenterologist, um, I had kind of changed up my diet a little bit, um, take away some of the things that were um, less acidic, um, make sure that I wasn't um, drinking, you know, like gallons of orange juice mm-hmm. and um, things like, um, I'm trying to think, like broccoli, cauliflower, things that were um, gas producing. <laughs> He said, you know, take those out, uh, nuts, things like that. Um, But he said, you know, you're a normal 36 year old and don't feel like this has to hinder you at all. So um, whenever Joseph was born, I had a C-section. So I was already familiar to an abdominal surgery to begin with. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I have a horizontal insection uh, from the C-section and now I have a vertical uh, incision from the colon section. So I've got a little tea that makes. <laughs> you also may, may one day have a podcast episode called Laura farted too much. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, my husband would love that. He thinks it's, <laughs> uh, well, we'll see. Maybe you'll hilarious. say something else that'll get you off of that one, but Good. <laughs> strong contender right now. Um, so anyway, so you had, like you said, you have a, a, a stepchild who's the, you're, you're older and then yes. your younger, um, is the type one. Yes. Diagnosed at three, in your note to me, you're talking about pretty significant, I felt, behavioral issues, especially mm-hmm. for a three-year-old. Can you tell me um, what was going on and did it just sort of start out of nowhere? I mean, was he like a pain in the butt when he was nine months old or like what happens? So um, when he was born, um, like I said, being in education, I had to go back to work with you know, limited time off. Um, he was born at the beginning of January and I went back, uh, last week of February and it was about six weeks after he'd been born. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky enough to have an amazing friend who was a stay at home mom. And she kept him for, um, the time from the time he was six weeks old till he was uh, about 18 months. Okay. And so um, we were able to thankfully kind of avoid all of, you know, the daycare snot and all that fun stuff that first, you know, year and a half that he was able to be with her. Um, He started school when he was 18 months and it was kind of one of those, he was impulsive, very much, uh, he was aggravated a lot of times when things didn't go his way, uh, more so than a I would think a regular 18 month old would be, um, he would push or hit or whatever. And we didn't really have that at home. And so it was kind of one of those, like, where is this coming from? Um, he's obviously never liked the word. No, he, (laughs) he's stubborn. He likes to get his way. Um, and there's, you know, a ta- there's a 10 year age gap between him and his sister. And so, you know, it's not like they hang out and, you know, they'll play with each other to a point, but you know, a 15 year old and a five year old, you're, you're not going to see them together 24 seven. A pretty enemies. limited intersection of um, ideas <laughs> yeah. and thoughts. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, <laughs> and by so the anyways, way, if your 15 year old is really has that much in common with your five year old, then your 15 year old has a problem. Like, you, you know, know. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but yeah, so he, um, 
he would get in trouble at school and it would just kind of be hit or miss um, a lot of times, but I'll, I would kind of dread getting the note home. Um, what had happened during the day? <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh God, did he hit? He didn't bite. I will say that. Thankfully he did get bit, but he didn't bite himself. Um, but he would push or he would um, shove or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tried lots of different, behavioral interventions where we would, you know, let him be off on his own, give him time to vent certain things or whatever. So, um, he's at that school for a full year, almost two years, almost two years. And he had gotten, it had gotten to the point where the school was like, let's take a break. (laughs) <laughs> they weren't necessarily. <laughs> it's not us. It's you. Get out. <laughs> yeah, they weren't necessarily saying you're out. You're gone. Uh, but they said let's take a break. You know, come back in the fall. Um, he was going to go during the summer a couple of days for like a Mother's Day out kind of thing, just to keep him in for a little bit of you know kid interaction. Um, so, anyways, he's out. But I'm still working at that point. And I have to figure out whether or not I can get him into another school. And thankfully, it was only a couple of weeks. I had, I had visited a couple of other schools. But the problem is, is you go into it um, with this stigma that your kid's been a behavior problem. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's one of those kind of things that every school's different. They deal with things in different ways. But uh, the new school he went to was great. Brought him in. Welcomed him. Um, he had the only thing I didn't like about that was there's teachers changed a little bit more frequently. There's a little bit more turnover at that school. Well, yeah, they have more stress. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, but they had a built-in cafeteria. They provided food if we needed it. Um, he ended up not liking the foods that they they did. Um, but once we had left the previous school, one of his teachers had suggested going to look into occupational therapy to see if there might be some sensory issues. So mm. we ended up going to our... Um, occupational therapist here in town. He did get diagnosed with sensory processing disorder. We went through several um, months worth of therapy. Things started to get better. And then, bam, he's diagnosed. (laughs) And we're like, maybe this isn't sensory. Maybe this is something that's related with the diabetes. Um, But my, both my stepdaughter and my husband um, and a couple of members of his family have ADHD. And so there's definitely some um, signs pointing to things that are, you know, related to ADHD, that there's a good chance he has it or ADD. Um, not sure. Too young to diagnose at this point. And we definitely don't want to medicate him um, at five years old, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so he's diagnosed. He was at the school um, the new school that we had moved to for a total of, see, he went in May, he was diagnosed in October and he went a little bit during the summer. So what, five, six months. Mm. So, um, it was one of those things when he got diagnosed, uh, when we were in the hospital, I was, you know, scared talking with my husband, like, what if they don't take him back because of this? You know, that's obviously it's a, it's a daycare. It's not a, a school. It's not public. There's no nurse, but, when I called them, um, he got diagnosed over a weekend. So of course we had a couple of days to fret over it. But, um, when Monday came around, I was able to call them from the hospital. They said, Oh no, that's great. We actually have another type one here. She's a little bit older, um, comes to the after school program. So we're familiar with the finger sticks, um, and insulin if we needed to give it. So it was kind of one of those, Oh, okay. Breathe a little bit kind of thing. Givoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages 2 and above. Not only is Givoke Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to givokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Givoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit Givoke Glucagon. Dot com slash risk. I love the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. That is not hyperbole. It is small and easy to hold. 
It has a super bright light for nighttime viewing. It has test strips that allow you to go back in if you don't get enough the first time. You know what I mean? Like you touch the blood and it's like, oh, that wasn't enough. So you go back and do it again. It doesn't impact the accuracy of the test. And speaking of accuracy, the Contour Next One blood glucose meter is incredibly accurate. And you deserve that. You deserve a meter that doesn't take up a bunch of space in your pocket, that doesn't waste test strips, and that gives you accurate results. And you can have it. And to be honest with you, it's not really that expensive. Whether you're paying with your insurance or cash, you should check out the price of the Contour Next One. It's very, very affordable. Head over to contournext.com forward slash juice box and check it out. While you're there, you can look at other products that they have available and even look into the free Contour Next One meter that you may be eligible for. And of course, their test strip program. Pick around, there's a lot going on on that website that will help you live a more carefree lifestyle with diabetes. Last thing, please check out the T1D Exchange. T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. This is a very simple and quick way that you can help type one diabetes research right from the comfort of your home. If you're a United States citizen who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of a person with type 1 diabetes, you're eligible to participate. And it only takes a few minutes to do. It's 100% HIPAA compliant, completely anonymous, and your answers will go a long way towards helping people with type 1 diabetes to live better. And every one of you who uses my link, t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box, will also be helping the podcast when you finish the survey. Thank you very much. Now let's really get into the meat of this conversation with Laura. I have a couple of questions. So I don't want to get yeah. too far ahead without asking my questions. So first of all, I feel for you because I, I once had a dog kicked out of a kennel and that was horrifying yeah. Actually, i was walking out like i'm so sorry uh you, you know and and uh i can't even imagine like what that must feel like for someone to say hey you know you need to get your kid out of here because well the, to their point i will say they did offer in the fall they said hey you want to come back let's try this again so at least they did offer well, um, and it was yeah yeah that's all cool i just mean in that initial moment when you're when you're <laughs> yeah. standing there like hi it's me it's laura i'm here to pick up my kid and they're like yeah don't bring that kid back here you're yeah. like whoa, whoa okay and like you said you were like you'd wait for it right like there yeah. were and that's got to be stressful too it was yeah, it yeah was. no kidding um and so okay so here we are you've tried these things for you know, different issues. You're wondering if it's ADHD, maybe it's sensory, maybe it's not. You get right. the diagnosis for the type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess let's delve into that and then we'll bring it back sure. around again. So uh, how do you, how does the type one present? At that point, he's three, he hadn't potty trained yet. And we had started really, really um, working on that whenever he was home over the weekends and uh, working at school because the school had a bathroom in the classroom. And so they would take him and, you know, just peers around him would show. And um, so we really, really were working on potty training. So it seemed like he was getting it, but um, he would be drinking excessively like down a drink and then want another one five seconds later, right. but then go to the potty, um, right. You know, as soon as he finished the one, uh, so we're, my husband were like, Oh, he's getting it. He's getting a Skittle for it. And he wants to go potty. Well, we get calls from the school. Um, so this all starts kind of on a Sunday night. He wet the bed on Sunday night and he ended up having to go to school the next day. Um, I put him in a pull-up, but he was wetting through the pull-ups. And I, I want to say that week, because um, we ended up going to the hospital on a fri on that Friday. So it was really only a week of symptoms. We ended up, um, I brought up maybe four or five sets of clothes over a two-day period of time that he was at school because he had wet through them so badly and mm. needed to be changed, even with the extra set of clothes that you know you already have there. So it was one of those things that my um, husband was venting to a couple of people at work and saying, you know, this potty training is going good, but oh my gosh, he's wetting himself so much. And he had said something to one of his coworkers and she said, that sounds like type one diabetes. You mm. need to get that checked out. So 
it's ironic and it's kind of a scary story that she said. I'm not sure who was related to her or she knew, but they had somebody they knew that had a kid that got diagnosed, but the kid was a little younger and it gotten so thirsty that the kid was drinking out of the dog's water bowl. Wow. And so she had told that to my husband and he's like, you know what, let's just go get this checked out. So, um, that all started on Sunday. I was able to get him an appointment on that Friday with our pediatrician, but she is half day only clinic on Fridays. And so when we went in, I unfortunately wasn't able to contain him to be able to get um, a blood draw or a finger stick. He was fighting. He's combative. And, and he's got skills. He does. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bad ninja skills when it comes he to He bobs and weaves. <laughs> he's got good footwork. He knows how to stick and move. Yeah. He'd catch you with a right cross out of nowhere. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. You were <laughs> in it danger. Also, <laughs> it also didn't help the fact that I was pretty squeamish about blood. Um, it's funny now with all of the finger sticks and um, we were doing injections for a while there and pod changes and everything. I've gotten a lot better. Um, but when she went to go do the blood, I was like, oh, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, all right, let's figure out something else. Um, whenever your husband gets off work, we can figure something else out. So I called him after lunch. He got off a little early and we went to an urgent clinic uh, in okay. town and he was able to kind of help out and they tested his sugar. Um, it was one of those uh, surreal moments because they were like, I think this meter's broken because it's saying it's over 700. So it was pretty high. Um, so they tested him two two times to be sure. And both times it was over 700. So much that their meter didn't say a number. It just said over 700. Mm. High. So, yeah, we're um, at that uh, urgent clinic and they call the pediatrician and say, you know, what do you want to do? They, she says, get him to Dallas to the Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. So they bring over a crew from Dallas uh, Children's Hospital and he gets ambulanced to the airport, which he thought was really cool. He had never flown before. Um, and we get in one of the children's hospital jets and we go into Dallas and uh, ambulance back from the airport to children's. And my husband drives because it's not a big enough plane for all of us to go. Okay. Um, and so my stepdaughter was away uh, visiting her other grandparents at that point uh, in the Dallas area. So once we got there, she was able to come up and see us as well. But we um, actually funny thing is, is in the amount of time it took us, like I said, we live about two hours east of Dallas. My husband was able to drive, go home, get all of the stuff we needed and meet us there in about the same time. So it took us about two hours. It's not that long of a flight, but it took us about that long to get there. <laughs> you guys could have just <laughs> funny. I was <laughs> we could have just driven, whatever. Yeah, pulled him in a wagon, maybe, and even made it yeah. a reasonable amount of time. It sounds like I, I was wondering I, when you said that, I thought, well, maybe they were really far from where they needed to go, or how yeah. dire was this situation? They were just like, hey, we haven't used this plane all day. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just get it out. <laughs> but thankfully, my husband's insurance, um, he works for uh, higher education, a junior college, and so he has state insurance and it covers all of the ambulance and all of the plane rides. So I was going to say, that was my that next was, question. Like, how much did nice. it cost? To, <laughs> yeah. To when take... I saw what, what got billed, I was like, wow, $40,000 plane flight. That's awesome. Wow. No <laughs> kidding. Jeez. But yeah, oh, my gosh. All, Thank goodness. Like, can you imagine if your insurance was like, wait, what? No, you oh could have drove there at the same time. You'd have been like, yeah. oh, yeah, I know. Honestly, we yeah. could have. <laughs> We're going to put you on a payment plan. I, I would yep. been like, no, thanks. Uh <laughs> I'll pay this out until he's 18 or yeah, older. I'll send you $15 <laughs> a year just until this yep. is all taken care of. Um, okay. So, wow. You get to the hospital and, I mean, his blood sugars, especially for a little person. I wonder how much yeah. different that is. Probably not. But it made me wonder, like, is a higher blood sugar like that in a smaller body more dire than in a larger I, one? Or I wonder what the I do feeling wonder that. was. Yeah. So the great thing about this urgent clinic is, is they cater to pretty much every need that you could ever want. They have people that come around and say, do you want a massage? You want a bottle of water? They've got all this, you know, food available. Well, to you everybody. did come in on a jet. You seem important. <laughs> well, well, no, this is at the urgent clinic. Oh, so back at home. <laughs> and so, of course, while he's there prior to us going in, of course, he's like, I want a candy bar. I want a soda. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure that probably didn't help the situation. So it might have been a little lower prior to him eating all that food. Gotcha. But yeah. They, <laughs> he um, drove his blood sugar up with the good eats. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> so they ended up, I'm trying to think. So the team that came from Dallas had, you know, this chart that they had based on his weight and um, the insulin that he needed. And so they were able to give that to him prior to him going, hooked him up to an IV. Um, IV was going while he was on the plane ride. It was, it was interesting, Mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we get to Dallas, come through the emergency entrance, get into our room. Um, They start him on diluted because of his size. At that point, I look back now and I tell my husband all the time, like, I wish I would have known. I see the pictures and I'm like, wow, he did lose weight. I I don't even know how that's something you don't notice. Um, You know, the circles under his eyes, things like that. I look back, uh, you know, just kind of sad about it. But um, he ended up, like I said, he was on diluted once he was in the hospital for the first day. I want to say, then they realized that he was going to need a little bit more. So they put him on the regular strength. We started on Novolog and we were doing syringes because he was on um, quarter units at that point. Okay. Um, and then once he got on the regular, we were able to do the half units and then they switched us over to uh, pin on the Humalog and we still did the syringe for the Lantus Mm -hmm. that he was doing. He did a morning dose of the Lantus, uh, but it was hospital protocol whenever we were in that if they changed his um, dosage or the type that you had to stay for an extended period of time to get everything. Regulated is not the right word, but I think that's kind of what they're. How they thought of it. So every time they made a change to this, they thought now you have to stay longer. Not not every change, okay. but change from the diluted to the full strength makes that or that's reasonable enough. Change from I guess. the Nova Log to the Humalog. Well, that I don't understand, but okay. Yeah. All right, and so how long did you end up staying? About four days. Wow. I think we were there three and a half. We we went home on Tuesday, so we got there Friday about midnight Saturday morning, uh, and then left about lunchtime on Monday. You know, as I'm saying that, Arden was in the hospital for like four or five days, too. Yeah. So, uh, and she was little. She was two. And, you know, her blood sugar was pretty, pretty darn high when she got there. Uh, yeah. So, I don't I don't know how much of that is is just good common sense or how much of it is mm-hmm. being careful because of how little they are and they can't talk and there's all right. these other things. By the way, uh, before I forget this, if the person whose kid drank out of the dog bowl listens to this podcast, shoot me an email because <laughs> yeah, for sure, you're totally getting on the podcast, just in, you know, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, I just really didn't want to forget to say that before we right? move forward. Um, because that seems really, that really right? makes the point, doesn't it? You know? Yep. <laughs> wow. So you guys get home. I'm interested in, because you, you describe your husband and your stepdaughter have ADHD a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't like blood. So yeah. you guys were just a, a, a great my, well, trio to get involved in type 1 diabetes, right? So my husband was actually great about it. And my stepdaughter is fine about it. Um, he actually was a, uh, he worked in college as a, it's not a phlebotomist, but he uh, worked at a plasma center. So he has no problem with blood at all. He mm-hmm. could do it in his sleep and probably find a vein. Um, even now, you know, 15, 20 years later, right. he could probably still do it in his sleep. But yeah, he had no problems. Um, and he was the one to initially do all of the doses because I just, I wasn't there yet. Um, but it didn't take long. I was stepping in and, and saying, you know, this is my kid. I've got to do it for him. And you know, there's really no other option. Yeah, it turns out you didn't have as much of a phobia as you just didn't really like it. And yeah, yeah, you were much. able to like write that ship pretty well. Well, I I yeah. would expect obviously no less. It's that stupid thing that you know you hear people say all the time, like you know I could never do that, and you're like, oh yeah, sure you could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely could. Don't forget the hiker who cut off his own arm. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I'd like to make a list of people who think they could cut their arm off with a pen knife. Uh, that's right. a pretty short list. Then all of a sudden you find your arm trapped in between two boulders and you say to yourself, huh, I guess I can do this. Yes, <laughs> so, I can. Yeah, because I don't want to die here. Um, yep. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, everybody kind of came together and got it together right away. What was the technology like? Did you guys transfer away from MDI pretty quickly or what was your path like for that? Um, I guess that's a relative term. So um, quick for some people, because, you know, some hospitals and endos require that you be diagnosed for at least six months or something. Um, We actually, so he was diagnosed on October the 19th 
And I actually just scrolled through some memories and saw that his first Dexcom, we got a G6. Um, his first one that we inserted was on November 6th. So relatively short for that um, to be doing finger sticks. Yeah. Um, so that was that was great. And it's like I've heard you say before and many other people, um, we could have done MDI forever if it meant that we got to keep the G6. But um, once we actually got on the Omnipod, it's it's been great. But we started that, his birthday, first week of January. And we actually went to a water park for his birthday because who gets to go swimming in January? So we went to an indoor water park for his birthday. Mm. And he did the um, uh, demo pod while we were there and just kind of kept it on, see how it would work while we were in the water. Good test. It was, yeah, good test. It, It worked out well. And my husband and I went in and did the sailing test with the endo. Um, and at this point we are still seeing a Dallas endo team. Um, at that point we're four months in and we do the sailing test. He and I go up, he wears it for a couple of days. I wear for a couple of days and do all the settings and pretend, you know, to put stuff in. Uh, and then he starts it later that week. So, um, October to January, we did an MDI and then he started Omnipod uh, in January. I'd call that pretty quickly. And yeah, so, his, I'm assuming his blood sugars become more regulated, obviously. And what were his A1Cs like through the first like number of tests? How did it? Yeah. Um, go? So when he was first diagnosed, he's a 10.5, and then um, we actually had our first endo uh, checkup a month later, so not that much longer. So it really didn't decrease that much because we're still doing MDI. We had only had the Dexcom for like a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. So really not good data there, but it went down to a 10.3 the next month. But, you know, progress, it's going down um, to a 9.4 right. I'm trying to think right before he got the Omnipod, maybe like January, middle of January. Yeah. And then in between that appointment and his next appointment, I found the podcast and he was on the Omnipod and we went from a 9.4 to a 7.8. So wow. like a huge jump. It's a nice leap. Huge, huge jump. Um, and the great thing about it was, is he wasn't having a lot of lows at that point. We were able to catch him. We were able to, to bump and nudge based on, you know, things. The great thing about a toddler, as you know, is their variance in food is pretty limited. So thankfully he was eating a lot of the same foods. So I was able to get a good, amount of um, data based off of that. Yeah, it's more good practice. I, I tell people all the time, like when when you're really struggling, it kind of seems boring, but pick a weekend and make the same meal like two or three times in a row. Like, you know, yep. like the same breakfast, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the same lunch, the same dinner. And it's a little boring, but at least you can do something, watch it happen, make an adjustment, yep. see what happens again, all in a short time period. It's a way to make it fun with kids, I guess, if you if you yeah. try. Um, but it's so much easier than, you know, doing macaroni and cheese today and the next day yeah. trying pizza and the third day doing a salad and like all your oh data is meaningless then, yeah. you know, like it's to make the next good decision. So that's actually what I, I mean, I've done it pretty much ever since the beginning, but I do that now. Breakfast is our struggle, like most people's is. And so, um, of course, he wants to have things that are really kid friendly, you know, muffins, uh, cereal, of course. Um, you know, and so I'll just pick a week and say, all right, this is what we're doing. We're going to eat it every day for this week and try and get it better each time that we do it. That's pretty cool. And it works, right? Yeah. And it works. Yeah. Yeah. You just need, you just need the repetition really. So, so did little Mike Tyson's skills deplete as his blood sugars came down like what was they did so in addition to uh getting the blood sugars more regulated we were able to cut out a lot of artificial dyes um which has been tremendously helpful um now don't get me wrong if he's got a school party and i go up and they want to have you know fruit loops or you know cookies or whatever and they're totally all artificial Mm. i'm not going to deny him that by any means but on the regular we do pretty natural stuff um still he think eats things like a natural gogurt or um, a natural applesauce things like that but 
cutting out the dyes and um, getting the blood sugars regulated have definitely been helpful. Now, don't get me wrong. He's still a little spitfire Mm -hmm. and (laughs) sometimes rivals me in some of the things he says. I'm like, where did you hear that? (laughs) But a lot of times I'm like, oh, wait, there's a 15 year old sister. I know where he (laughs) heard that. (laughs) You know, he's got to be pissed. I'm assuming you're raising him as a Cowboys fan and that would make any child unhappy. Um, So, um, unfortunately, my husband would have to disagree with you on that. Uh, It's (laughs) it's funny. You're either are or you aren't. Um, He's a Steelers fan. So we we uh, we root for the Pittsburgh Steelers. No kidding. All the way from Dallas. Well, then I don't know what the kid's problem is. (laughs) <laughs> I know, right? Pulled together. That's all. <laughs> well, I, I'm interested about the dyes. Uh, yeah. I, 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 we try hard here. I try hard here uh, to push what I just consider to be basic foods on my family. Like, I, yeah. I, I want you to look at your meal and be able to say, oh, there's chicken and butter and salt. Like, yeah. like and to know what's in it, you know, Um I may, you know, if you make your own bread, there's, you know, it's yep. flour and butter and water and yeast and sugar and not much more else. You know what's in it. It's got a little bit of sugar in it, honestly. Um, I, I'm a fan of that. And, um, but I, I've never considered dyes before. Uh, what, yeah. what is that about? So that was, um, so like if you open a box of Fruit Loops up and you look at the side, you've got Red 40, you've got Yellow 1, it's all these dyes. Red 40 was the big one um, that I noticed. It was kind of um, interesting. I would do these little experiments. There was um, Kool-Aid that we did one day at school. I let him have a Kool-Aid Zero. And then um, the next day we had another one. And so it was two days straight of having this Kool-Aid Zero with Red 40 in it. And his behavior was just crazy. I, um, I just knew that it was related to that because t- the next couple of days he didn't have it. He was fine. I didn't get any notes home. Wow. I just, so I just Googled red 40 side effects. It yeah. says the three most widely used culprits, yellow five, yellow six, and red 40 contain compounds, including benzidine and four. Wow. What is that word? Amino biphenol. The research mm-hmm. has linked uh, this with cancer research has also associated food dyes with problems in children, including allergies, hyperactivity, learning impairment, irritability, and aggressiveness. How about that? Yep. Wow. All it right. It was one of those just writings on the wall. So um, that was that it just stuck in us that we've got to do better for him because obviously as a five-year-old, he's going to pick whatever any other kids picking out, but with the ADHD and the sensory stuff, it just, hypes it up even more Hmm. yeah yeah it's just uh, compounds it right just one one issue on top of another and wow okay well i'm glad you told me about that that's not something i ever considered before i don't know that i eat a lot of red food uh that doesn't get itself red but i know a lot of people do and you'd be surprised in some of the things yeah um thankfully you know with you know being type one he likes to drink drinks the water with additives and all of your ones that are just, you know, um, powders you pour in, those have it. Um, so we couldn't do like crystal light. We couldn't do anything, but they do make some dye free ones, which has been great. He likes those and some natural ones that have come out that are flavored with like, um, one of my favorite drinks that he drinks is a juice box. So it looks like anything else like another kid would drink. Um, but it's flavored with monk fruit. Um, but I know a lot of people have allergies to things like that, but thankfully he doesn't, right. but it has, it has one carb, um, and it tastes just like a regular juice box. So that's been a great find. I'm going to check my wife's food cause she can get aggressive sometimes. <laughs> sometimes we have to check ourselves. So, um, we actually started eating a little bit more healthy after he was diagnosed, not so much. So, um, for the dyes, but for a lower carb, because we had heard at that point, you know, this is two years ago, but we had heard that, you know, lower carb is a little easier on type one, you know, the health benefits for us were definitely an added bonus, Mm -hmm. but we started eating, um, kind of a mixture between keto and, uh, weight watchers. Um, and we just kind of kept with it. He's still really not eating a lot of the things that we eat. And I know going into it, I was one of those parents, my kid's going to eat everything that we eat and I'm not going to make a separate meal for him. Well, when he's three years old and you cook something, he's like, I'm not eating that. And you've already given him insulin. I'm like, 
Okay, well, he's going to eat something. <laughs> so, plus, he really he blackened your eye a little bit. So you're really exactly. you're just, he's probably the sweetest little kid. And it just, <laughs> <laughs> and <it's> just <laughs> he is. It's so funny this morning because um, he's with my parents today because uh, it's you just me it and him anymore. home for no, the summer. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's me and him for the summer. And he, of course, likes to be underfoot, you know, 24 7 because mm-hmm. he's a mama's boy. But, um, he, whenever I left him, he was like, I love you. And he blew me a kiss. And it's like, oh, you can't leave that. <laughs> uh, that's, love, that's wonderful. Listen, I, it sounds like you've got him moving in the right direction for certain. For sure. It is interesting, too, to to see how, I mean, how aggressive to not, you know, in a short amount of time is is really interesting. And you do wonder how many people wouldn't think to, I mean, obviously, you, know, you could look at the diabetes, but you know, I don't know that all of that aggression in the beginning, you know, unless he was honeymooning going into diabetes for a, mm-hmm. a long time, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem reasonable just to point yeah. it to that. Um, but I definitely think the dyes and the ADHD were a big, big part of it. Yeah, um, it's it just mix. the diabetes on top of it definitely didn't help the situation. Right, right. Yeah. You're just adding a different, again, compounding a different problem on top of it. For sure. I have to tell you, like, you don't, Listen, I don't know people. Some people probably think about it fine. But when uh, coronavirus started, I took like one good look in the mirror and I thought to myself, Scott, you are the kind of person who will gain weight during something like this. And, Same. Right. And so I was like, let's not do that. You know, yeah. and um, all I did was go to uh, an intermittent fasting schedule. And just I just eat for eight hours a day. And for 16 hours a day, I don't eat. So I Basically yep. eat from like 11 to, you know, 7 or sometimes it's noon to 8, but that's mm-hmm. pretty much it right there. And I'm hmm, I'm 13 pounds lighter than I was when coronavirus started. Nice. And, and in thank you, and in between those times that that 11 to 7, I do not limit what I'm eating. Like yesterday yeah. I had like a pulled pork sandwich and ice cream for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I don't gain weight and I was just like, "Huh." And I had some heartburn that has completely disappeared. And don't get me wrong, like I'm not like I'm not eating a, a Twinkie on the half hour or anything like that. You know, like I'm not uh, and I have actually in full in full uh clear uh, to be clear here, I guess. I also and I've mentioned it once before, I cut out um refined oils. Oh, so okay. I, I've never cut anything out of my my life before like that. Uh mm-hmm. but so anything that is any oil that is uh, refined or pressed with heat, I won't use anymore. So like even like no canola, no vegetable oil, like that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just using, uh, what am I using? Uh, olive oil, like, you know, the, mm-hmm. the lightest kind and, yeah. you know, and only cold pressed. Yeah. Uh, I'm not putting obviously that much effort to do it. I don't even know what I'm doing when I'm talking about it, but <laughs> I've just cut out like certain oils and, and, and that's it. So, you know, when you cut that out, you're cutting out potato chips, I guess, yep. um, stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, I would say that's pretty much it. Like, I'm not eating anything out of a bag. I'm not having certain oils, and I'm only eating for eight hours a day and 13 pounds yeah. in like three or four months now. So, my husband also does intermittent fasting um, a lot. And it's same thing, like you were saying, just so many benefits to it. Um, and I remember a couple episodes ago, you were still wearing the pro and you were doing the fasting and you noticed how much things were uh, better whenever you were in that fasting state when well, the foods weren't involved. Especially if you're a person who at some point is going to become type two, mm-hmm. you know, there's long stretches of every 24 hour period where you're just, you don't appear to be using very much of your own insulin, right? you know, and um, my blood sugar would sit super stable for those 16 hours. And it's still like once in a while, something would happen. Like I had a bad dream. My blood sugar jumped way up. That was interesting, you know, um, to see. Uh, And there were some foods that obviously were harsher than others. But when I, when I called on my insulin after not eating for 16 hours, it did the job, you know, 120, back down mm-hmm. again mm-hmm. you know you'd really have to eat to get the 130 or 135 like i pressed it one time really hard arden made a cake and it was just like i mean there's no way to know how many cups of sugar were in this confection you know but it was a lot <laughs> of sugar and i was like i just ate two of them i'm like let me see what happens here my, my, <laughs> in the name of science yeah, well it really was because no kidding the second one i was 
pushing down. I was like, oh, I don't really want yep. this, you know, and yep. uh, like 135, something like that. And I was like, oh, all right. So, you know, but I don't know what would happen if I was having smaller snacks throughout the day. And I guess mm-hmm. I'm going to get to wear one more sensor at some point and I'll uh, I maybe will take a day and break my fasting to to see what happens if it just drives you up all day long. Uh, right. But I think that's going to be the case. I think you're going to you're going to end up laying in that 110 space for hours and hours at a time instead of being in that 85 space. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm not into obviously. If you listen to this podcast, I'm not into telling people how to eat. Um, and I really think that at its core, this podcast is about how to use insulin, and sure. then from there, it's how to use it however you want to eat. Like I just want people to understand how it works so that if they choose low carb or they choose, you know, red dye number 40, they still know how to use their insulin. That's exactly important to me, you know? So it's cool that you guys found all this out. It's really, uh, I I'm trying so hard to get somebody on to talk about intermittent fasting, but yeah, I've found anybody yet. Like I really want like somebody who's a, I don't know, a a specialist, somebody that could really talk about it. Cause I don't know what I'm talking about. I only have, (laughs) I only have anecdotal, you know, information about what's happening to me. I think same here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, all right, listen, we're we're creeping up on an hour here. Did we? Yeah. Um, I want to feel like did we miss it? Oh, I guess I do want to understand a little bit. Um, about you, had, you experienced that really big drop in A one C, and yeah. what were the changes that you made that led to that decrease? Well, at that point, um, it was just instilling the things that we were listening to on the podcast, um, bump down our high alerts, and we're able to kind of catch things, be a little bit more proactive instead of reactive. But um, so I didn't get to say, so he's actually been at three schools prior, and he's not even in kindergarten yet. Um, But during the summer of last summer, 2019, I took him out because I was at home um, and I wanted to really focus on getting the uh, blood sugars in, under control. And we, um, I took a chance because if I didn't keep him in, there was a chance that he would lose a spot. And they don't usually fill up, but it, they happen to for that uh, fall session. And so he lost a spot and he ended up having to go to another school. Um, but it was another kind of blessing in disguise. The um, second school the way they managed was the office personnel were the ones that did the finger sticks. They did the insulin giving, um, all that. And the teachers were left out of it. Mm. Um, and I would talk to them via their phones. And a lot of times it was, I had to wait longer than I needed to or wanted to for something to happen. And so whenever he moved to the third school, the one most recently, which, um, they did theirs, with the teacher because they had a much smaller classroom. I think he only had like eight kids in his class. And so she was able to do things all herself, trained her, um, had the CD uh, from our endo talk to her and she was amazing. Um, I look back now and wish that I could have had her as his teacher for all four years that he was in school. school. That's so cool. Um, But yeah, so she dealt with it all, but um we were able to um, hone things in over the summer. And so his lowest A1C prior to this uh, 2019-20 school year was uh, about 6.2. So it was it was pretty good. We were rocking and rolling. But um, then coronavirus happened and I had my surgery. And I honestly I actually haven't been back to work because of all of the stuff since February. And right. it's now 1st of July. But um when we got off uh, during that time period, I had attempted looping back in August of 2019. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you remember this or not, because Arden would have been older and the smaller doses wouldn't really have mattered to her. But the algorithms, smaller doses hadn't been figured out. It's like it was missing ticks here and there. I remember. And yeah, so, I do. Yeah. So it was one of those things where if I couldn't get this setting uh, and loot figured out before school, I wasn't going to feel safe sending him. So we ended up, we did it for, uh, about a month and things just weren't going like they needed to. So I said, let's pick this up later whenever they get this figured out. Mm. And so, um, the friend that I had talked about that went to the conference, uh, we met up, they had started looping with her two uh, type one kids and I had actually mentioned it to her and they were able to get theirs figured out pretty easily because 
her kids being a little bit older. And so um, February rolls along. I'm at home. He's been at home. And I'm like, you know what? This is the time. I've got to step in and we've got to do the sleuthing thing because I need to be able to feel safe with him going to kindergarten. Not that I wouldn't feel safe with him going. I just don't want to feel reliant on a school nurse or an aide to have to walk him somewhere. I want it to be where it's a little less thought of and a little bit more freedom for him. So we started looping in um, late February and we uh, listened to all of the episodes with looping that you had done. And um, the one with Kenny Fox actually was the best one. I was actually able to talk to him and it's crazy. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but you actually answered one of my questions on an Ask Scott and Jenny about oh. hormones, about growth hormones. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So um, th- our biggest struggle was going to sleep and he would shoot up, like skyrocket up moments after his head hit the pillow. And it was all growth hormones. So setting his ISF um, significantly lower, like it's double the ISF of his daytime. It's made things so much smoother. I can't tell you how many nights of sleep I've actually gotten. It's it's awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I I hear that from a lot of people who sleep better with an algorithm helping them overnight. It is really, yeah, not it's not even to be surprised by at this point. It's, it's just it happens and it's fantastic, you know. I just wish that it hadn't taken uh, everything to happen for us to jump on board as wholeheartedly as we did when we did. I, I wish we'd have done this sooner, but you know, it's one of those. Like I said, his teacher was great and did amazing with him during the school year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the transition over to kindergarten, um, you know, being in public schools, when I was uh, in the classroom, I actually, um, we split off into two teams of um, the common areas that taught. I taught a history class. So anyways, we had two teams. We had a special ed team and then we had a 504 um, ESL team. And so I was always the 504 ESL team. And I actually had a couple of type ones that came through my classroom over the period I was teaching. And I look back now and I think, you know, what was his blood sugar doing at this moment? Or did this affect it? It's so crazy. You think back and look, you know, and uh, they're all, you know, thriving adults at this point and they're, you know, often out of school, but it's, it's kind of a cool look back to see how things were without knowing because I had no involvement at that time. I can't tell you how much I think or how important I think it is to have some time to just reflect on what's going on. For sure. And it just, you know, I talk about it, I think a lot, but when things are going by so quickly and life's happening so fast, you're just trying to stay like just trying to stay on the map. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just don't want to get too lost here. Like, let me get the things done. I need to get done and to make my money. I got to clean something. I got to feed people. I have to shop. Like, you know, you have to do all these things when yep. that slows down a little bit. You can step back. You can really start seeing things like food dye and, you know, mm-hmm. where you're, how, how to make your boluses work better. And yep. I guess the real trick is, is how to find that time, you know, when we're all not locked inside, Right. Involuntarily. Um, yep. And because that most of your life is not going to be like that. With I should knock on wood. We are going to get out of here eventually, right? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, but, but, you know, like, th- it just it, it shines a light on the importance of reflection and to be able to watch something, you know, kind of thoughtfully and say, oh, I see what's happening here. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, and then to watch it happen over and over again until it builds in your mind. Because sometimes you see things that happen right in front of your face. And you don't notice them. Um, yep, can't see the forest for the trees. Definitely can't. You, you know, happens. It happens a lot. That's why I try to talk about people understanding. You know, macro and micro. Like think about things from further away. Sometimes don't be so yep. close up. You you miss a lot. You know, there's a it's a silly thing, but you know what they say, right? You know, you hold your hand too close to your face, and you can't see anything else but your hand. And so yep. back, you back away, and all of a sudden everything else is there. And I, that, that's just a. It's lucky for some people, obviously. Some people yeah. don't have the same kind of, um, you know, options in their life. But this gave it to a, a great many more people. Obviously, there's still people working that, you know, didn't get to, you know, they, they, they were found to be essential and, and, and yeah. didn't get to do this. But for so many people, I think they're having experiences like yours and, and like mine, really. Like, I don't know if I would have 
you know, I don't know if I would have tried the intermittent fasting. A friend of mine told mm-hmm. me about it a year ago, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, I didn't do it. And then I then I got pinched, and I thought, oh, I have to do something. And that was the thing that was on top of my sort of mental list of yep. if I'm going to worry about my health through food again, I think this is the thing I'm going to look at next is, is yep. I guess, how I thought of it. So. Very cool. I mean, you guys have been on a little bit of a roller coaster for a couple of years, but it seems yeah. like you're you're in a good spot now. Do you agree? I think it's one of those kind of things when you look back, like you said, perspective. I, I look at our A1Cs and times and range, and you know, it's in, been coming down ever since diagnosis, and we're in a spot now where it's more stable. I think that's the biggest key. It's the stability. Mm. So that's the peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. No bouncing around and, and keeping the time and range right. And, you know, right. all that other stuff. It, it It's interesting to me, though, that what seemed like you said, oh, I wish this would have happened more quickly for us. But really, what was it? It's a couple of years, right? Sure. Yeah. And and I know it's tough because sometimes you'll hear people on this podcast who find the podcast like in the hospital on day one mm-hmm. and they'll sound like, wow, they never really went through any of this stuff. But just remember if it makes you feel better that two years into Arden's diagnosis, I was still a pretty frequent cry- crier in the shower still, you, you, you know, and her, and her A1C was still like in the eights and, you know, yeah. and I didn't know what I was doing. And that wasn't even unthinkable then that was fairly common for people. Yeah. You know, so I, I like it. I like that we're, these timelines are getting shorter and shorter and, it, it somehow makes me happy that two years felt long to you. Not that not yeah. that it felt long, but that it, you know, because it, to, right. it's not really a very long time historically. Oh, yeah. When I look back at it, whenever he's an adult and managing himself, I'm going to be like, wow, those two years went by like a, in an instant. Oh, yeah. When he's fighting MMA. There you go. Probably choking, <laughs> choking people out for money in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the ring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he'll, probably, he'll probably grow up to be an artist. You know, uh, at at this point, he likes to do things with his hands. He's really into Legos. Um, of course, what boy isn't right? Mm. Um, he plays outside. Um, and actually, the thing that I'm still working on the most is activity with Loop and trying to figure out the best overrides or if I want to set it at a higher number. He started T ball this year. Um, we actually have a game tonight, and so going into it, just kind of putting that plan into place of how can I get him set up to be in a place where it's good to start with so that the game doesn't affect, you know, so still working on those. I think that's going to be something I'll be working on for a a little bit, especially with new schedules with kindergarten and who knows what ends up looking like if, if they're going to end up in the class altogether, if they're going to have to stay during lunch, who knows? Yeah. Um, I'm just, you just made me think that the Minnesota Twins just drafted a kid in the first round who has type one diabetes. Awesome! Uh, I can't think his name's Garrett. I can't think of his last name right now. Yeah, um, what's well, we cool. always try to tell uh, Joseph because a lot of times he'll be uh, listening, you know, while we're in the car. I um, might have the podcast on, and he'll say, "Oh, they have diabetes like me." Or we've seen a couple of people in the um, store. Uh, we've seen an Omnipod on a couple of people. I have a coworker that has type one, um, and it's it's like a unicorn you see. You're like out in public, and you're like, "Wow, somebody like me." Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna correct myself here. I I think it was the Brewers. Now hold on. Now I'm gonna find out because I'm gonna hold you up. Because you have to know. You're, you're, well, you know, Garrett. I want to say is it Garrett Mitchell. If anybody knows Garrett, I want to have him on the podcast. So, have him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Get him get him to reach out to me, please. Uh, but yeah, I think he was like the eighth, I don't know, twentieth pick, eighteenth pick, something like that. Let me look. I mean, he went high. Like he's gonna yeah. he's gonna play. He's gonna get paid. Like the whole yeah. thing. You, you know, um, so it's exciting to me that your son's starting T ball tonight. Um, when I can I can think back to my son's first practice. Uh, yeah. uh, for T-ball and the other day he was trying out for a, a semi-pro team and oh my uh, gosh that's know. so cool it, I would love for him to keep it up I played softball growing up my husband played baseball so we're, we're definitely a baseball family we love it and he has so much fun out there being with the other kids and it just the awesomeness that there's no restrictions that he can be out there just like anybody else yeah no, I believe that for sure and I think you'll figure it out too it's not going to be yeah. baseball is interesting at um, practice shouldn't affect him the same way a game does. And I think you would see higher blood sugars in baseball versus lower. If I had yeah. to guess, 
with the adrenaline. It's more yeah. adrenaline than it is activity because baseball's, you know, it's it's well it's, if in short spurts. If practice is any indication, I'm sure he probably won't move much at all because he kicks dirt. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, pay attention. There's a there's somebody well, batting. <laughs> I watched a boy pick up a bug once in the outfield, and I thought, I don't think he's long for this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, we'll see. That's really interesting. Well, I, Laura, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. And it was lovely to meet you in Dallas. Likewise. And hopefully one day I'll get to go back there again. But I mean, let's, great. let's be honest. We're not sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, the best to everybody there. Thank you very much for doing this. And thank you for having me. Of course. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. And don't forget to check out that Contour Next One blood glucose meter. You deserve an accurate blood glucose meter. It is simple to take care of, and if you're walking around with a little busted up meter or something that your doctor just handed you and you have no idea about its accuracy, take a couple of seconds to do yourself a favor. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. And don't forget to check out the T1D Exchange at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. The music beat me there, but I'm not going to go back and re-record this. <laughs>